disease had not been seen before. I was waiting in the emergency room one night when a mother holding her baby came running in. The baby was wrapped in layers and layers of blankets. I began to peel them back one by one. As soon as I caught sight of the baby's face, I saw the eyes were red, the lips were red, and the lymph nodes in the neck were so swollen that the baby's head was tilted to one side with the eye nearly closed. It was unbelievable. I was stunned. The baby's face looked exactly like the face of the first child I'd seen nearly a year before. I immediately looked closer to see his body and found the child had a rash on his belly, red palms, and swollen red feet. This was exactly what I'd seen before. At that moment, I knew this was something very new. So with that introduction in, in the words of Dr. Kawasaki himself, with a voiceover from Christina Turner, who traveled with us as a team uh, in 1998 to do the, that filming, um, Dr. Turner is on the faculty here at, at UCSD uh, in, is an anthropologist who's uh, studied extensively in Japan and, and fortunately for us is bilingual in Japanese. So there's some feedback here. I don't know if you can adjust the sound. Um, so with that, with that introduction, um, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the number of cases that we have here in San Diego. So I know a number of our parents are from other parts of the country. Um, but we don't think that we have a monopoly on Kawasaki disease here in San Diego. We don't have a lot of patients just because I'm here with the rest of my team taking care of patients. We have this many patients because we've worked so long with our communities to educate our physicians about KD, but we still miss cases of Kawasaki disease even here in San Diego. So. Um, Thank you uh, as a blanket statement to all the wonderful people in my uh, lab group at the Research Center who have worked very hard to make today possible for all of you um, and who uh, continue to do the work uh, of Dr. Kawasaki to try to understand more about this disease. So here is a snapshot of the number of research projects that we have ongoing at the center that involve both bench research, that means wet laboratories, so experiments that we can do in the laboratory, and then experiments and studies that we do with patients uh, actually uh, in the clinic. So there's a, a large variety of research projects ongoing here, and I hope you'll have a chance to talk with some of the researchers during the break uh, about the studies. The timeline has been uh, initiated by Dr. Kawasaki in his talk, in his words this morning. Uh, the first uh, written report in Japanese in 1967, then the English language report in 1974. So it really wasn't until 1974 that American physicians and researchers began to think about Kawasaki disease. Uh, it was independently described by Dr. Marion Mellish, who I haven't yet seen here this morning. Marion, are you here? Well, Marion will be joining us at some point, hopefully later this morning, who independently described Kawasaki disease, recognized it in Hawaii, and corresponded with Dr. Kawasaki in Japan and learned that it had also been seen there. Uh, in 1984, we enrolled the first patients in the gamma globulin trial. This was a multi-center trial. Many of the people involved in that trial are actually here uh, with us at the symposium. I'll be introducing them later. And in 1994, Dr. Kawasaki and Mrs. Dr. Kawasaki came over from Japan to open and help us celebrate the opening of the KD Research Center here at the University of California in San Diego. Now, 15 years later, uh, we're also celebrating again. And as of November 1st, we've launched a trial looking at, uh, rather a study, looking at adults, young adults after Kawasaki disease in childhood. And this has been made possible by a foundation, the Macklin Foundation, and Don Don, who is a trustee for the foundation, is sitting right down here in front. And I hope you all will have a chance to uh, thank him for the sponsorship of work that is going to lead to important answers to many of the questions that you have. So I wanted to give you this uh, stick figure diagram. This is what we imagine uh, happens uh, to give children Kawasaki disease. Unfortunately, this very central part here, although 
Uh, many of us have been working for uh, decades to try to understand what this piece might be. We still don't know. But we think the world is divided into genetically susceptible and genetically resistant hosts. And that means that your child was born with the pattern of genes that gave them the possibility to get Kawasaki disease if they came in contact with whatever the trigger was. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more about the etiology or the cause of Kawasaki disease, except it's not for lack of trying that we haven't found uh, a causative agent. Uh, we have some ideas about why this may be such a difficult task, but at the moment we have to say that the cause is unknown. So I want to um, share with you some, some numbers about how many children there are with Kawasaki disease here in our region. Uh, these numbers are expressed as an attack rate per 100,000 children less than five years of age. And you can see that we average, and, and actually in 2008 exceeded, a rate of 30 children per 100,000 less than five. And to put that in perspective, that same number, that same statistic for, let's say, tuberculosis, something that most people in, in the audience and in your life would have heard of, that same figure is four. So four per 100,000, 30 per 100,000. This is not a rare disease. And we've seen some trends over time. For those of you who have very young babies, babies under the age of 12 months, you can see where we've broken it down here in total number of KD cases taken care of at our hospital. You can see over the years, we're increasing, increasing the number of very young babies that we see. So there are some trends in the disease, and it is very hard to figure out is this because we're getting better education out there for our community physicians so that they can diagnose and recognize KD, or is this really a shift in the pattern of the disease? But this is why it's important to do these kinds of analyses, to track our patients, and see uh, uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, trends there may be in the disease. And even though in San Diego, I think we do a good job of taking care of our patients when they get to us, we can't go out in the community and find them. And that's where your part comes in. So I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about some of the things that you could do to try to help awareness of KD. This slide is to make the point that among our Asian American community here in San Diego County, these green bars are higher than all the other bars, and that means that our Asian population is uniquely susceptible to Kawasaki disease. And uh, it affects all children of all racial groups. Um, you can see that we have all of the American population represented here. Uh, but it uniquely uh, seeks out children of Asian ancestry, and uh, we know that that's part of the genetic picture of Kawasaki disease. Most of you are here because you had toddler age children, so this is the age and years of our patients, and you can see the majority of our patients are between one and two years of age. However, there is this uh, little tick out here for our teenagers, and I think we've gotten better in recent years at recognizing the disease among our teenagers who may have a slightly different presentation. So why should we study the genetics of Kawasaki disease? First of all, thank you to all our families in the audience who have participated, who have sent in the bad tasting scope mouthwash, um, who have allowed us to draw extra blood on your children. And we know already that uh, Kawasaki disease is worldwide, but there's some countries where the incidence is very high, for example, in Japan and other countries in Asia, but very low in the northern European countries, Sweden, Finland. We know that it runs in families, so these are pedigrees where each one of these little symbols is a person, and you can see the red symbols are people who are related to each other. Um, and we have many of our families with multiple affected members here today, and thank you for coming. We work with a, a large group of researchers. Genetic research is not something that you can do in a vacuum. And two of our collaborators, Mike Takahashi and Bill Mason from just up the road in Los Angeles, are here today. And I hope you'll seek them out during the break and uh, introduce yourselves to them. Dr. Marian Mellish should be coming as well. Uh, and we collaborate with Jane Newberger in Boston and the group in Chicago, Stan Schulman and Ann Rowley. So, 
Uh, it takes more than a village to get this kind of genetic research done. We collaborate uh, with investigators in Japan who have been an important part of the work, and then the international group. So those of you who have contributed DNA to our study, it's gone over here to uh, these dedicated researchers in Singapore. So you may have never been to see Singapore, but your DNA has gone there. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the trip. Um, so this is Dr. Martin Hibbard and Dr. Sonia de Villa, um, with whom we work very closely. And actually, next week, we'll be meeting uh, everyone uh, in London uh, to go over the latest results. So how do we go about our genetic studies, and what do we hope to learn? Um, everybody comes into the world carrying two sets of uh, information, one set that you inherit from your mother and one set from your father, and these are not identical. So here's a, a KD parent here, here's their child, and in a sense, when, when the embryo is formed, the parent has a choice. They can either send down to the next generation this form of the gene or its partner over here. And we can then look at what the child inherited and if we see that uh, the form of the gene that we're going to call B here was always transmitted or more often transmitted to the child, then we know that uh, B actually affects the susceptibility to Kawasaki disease. If, however, it seems to be pretty much equal that half the time A goes, half the time B goes, then that conclusion would be there's no effect on KD susceptibility of that particular spot that we're looking at. And when I say spot, we're actually looking at over a million different places in the group of genes that each of you have. So um, we, are, we are hunting uh, for this. Um, we can do this very easily just by isolating the DNA from mouthwash um, or from blood, and now we have a sponge kit that we can use for babies who don't need to have their blood drawn. So what are we hoping to learn from all of this? We're hoping to understand the basis of the genetic predisposition for why some children get aneurysms and some children don't, and for why some children get Kawasaki disease and other children don't. And how will that help us? What happens with these genetic studies is we identify biologic pathways that are important, where if you shift the pathway a little bit this way or a little bit that way, it actually changes the outcome of the disease. And that tells us that pathway is important. So this is going to help us and already has helped us to devise new treatment strategies. Um, and we hope in, in the not so distant future, it's going to help us to predict who the patients are at highest risk for complications of Kawasaki disease. And now that we have some new treatments, those patients may be candidates to receive more aggressive therapy. So you're making a difference. We can't do this work without you. And thank you to all of you for helping us make all of these projects a possibility because without your time and energy and your willingness to participate in this research, we couldn't make the answers that we hope are going to help all of our children. So thank you very much.